Welcome back. I'm Rick Hill with the Apostolate for Family Consecration. And in this show, we're going to go through chapter 4 as we continue our journey on salvation is from the Jews. Chapter 4 being the messianic idea of Judaism. And we're again privileged to have the author, Roy Shulman, here. So, Roy, what does Judaism teach about the coming of the Messiah? Um, hi, Rick. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, I think the first thing probably to say about that is that the coming of the Messiah is the center of Judaism, the center and heart of Judaism. And there is no Judaism really without the messianic expectation. And that's really uh, important to emphasize for two reasons. One is, uh, the, what, as we talked about in previous episodes, the whole relationship between Judaism and Christianity centers around the Messiah. The fact that Jesus was the Messiah, and therefore Christianity is essentially the continuation of Judaism after the coming of the Jewish Messiah. And so if you look at Judaism without the Messiah at the center, I mean, you lose everything. You lose its, its role in salvation history, and you lose its relationship with Christianity. But the other reason is because uh, contemporary Judaism, Judaism in the you know, 21st century and 20th century, moved away from being centrally focused on the Messiah. And I think that was largely a result of the Enlightenment. And if, frankly, how many Catholics take seriously the idea of the Second Coming? Right. It's kind of like that. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's kind of spacey and out there, but, you know, do we really think that the world is going to end and Jesus will come again? The answer is yes. You have no choice. It's dogma, it's in the creed, and so forth. But it's so supernatural that the kind of post-Enlightenment materialistic worldview has trouble coming to grips with it. And in Judaism, that's, that whole same attitude has um, had its effect on the expectation of the Messiah. But in fact, uh, as, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start by reading a quote, but the, um, the, the primary authority of, of Judaism is actually a rabbi uh, named Maimonides from the Middle Ages, I think it was uh, the 14th century. And he really codified Jewish law, and he is... Um, sort of the closest thing to a cat, you know, catechism of the Catholic Church. He's kind of the catechism of, of Judaism. And he makes it very explicit. He says, even if a Jew should commit every possible sin, he will still have a share in the world to come. But, he, but if he gives up his active hope in the coming of the Messiah, he's cut off and has no role in the, in no place in the world to come. Uh, in other words, he's lost in a way that he wouldn't be lost by committing every possible sin. And he came up, Maimonides came up with um, the 13 principles of Judaism, which is recited in, in the Jewish liturgy. It's exactly like the credo. It's the things that we believe this, you know, I believe this, I believe this. And one of those uh, items in the, in the Jewish credo is precisely, you know, that I, you know, that I believe in the imminent coming of the Messiah and that, you know, he will in fact come. And how did his teachings compare to the Old Testament teachings? The Old Testament is, um, is, is chock full of expectations of the coming of the Messiah. Um, again, the, you know, the, the very, you know, the very genesis of the Jewish people with Abraham being the father of the Jews, you know, what, what was he chosen for? He was chosen through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through your seed, the Messiah will come. Um, so the messianic idea in Judaism, the messianic expectation in Judaism is, is the heart and the center of it. And even though the Messiah had come at the end of the Old Testament and Maimonides was 14th century, were there any changes in what he was looking for in the Messiah in his teachings and his writings? Or was it the same teachings as the Old Testament? So let, me, let me actually put in an, an intermediate step there. By the way, I, I miss, my Maimonides was actually 13th century. That's my fault. Okay. I, I misspoke. Okay. Um, he was actually uh, 12th going into 13th century. Um, there is, uh, Judaism has two, one could say, sacred scriptures. One is the Old Testament which he, Judaism shares, of course, with the Christianity and with the Catholic Church. And the other is uh, called the Talmud. And I want to answer your question. I want to talk about what Judaism 
teaches about the Messiah, but much of what Judaism teaches about the Messiah is to be found in the Talmud, so I should probably back up and say what the Talmud is. Now, the Talmud is essentially sacred scripture. It has an authority in Judaism, one could say as great as the Old Testament, or one could say greater, because the Talmud actually teaches that its authority is greater than the authority of the Old Testament, and that if one should think one finds a contradiction between the Talmud and the Old Testament, it's the Talmud that should be believed. And before any um, Catholic should be too scandalized by that, because it is kind of scandalous on the face of it, I will point out its parallel in the Catholic Church, which is there is a, a real parallel between the Talmud and its relationship to the Old Testament and uh, Catholic dogma and its relationship to sacred scriptures. Because what the Catholic Church teaches, correct me if I'm wrong, is that sacred scripture is infallible, but it needs the teaching of the church to explain it properly. Right. So if you go to the Bible and you, mis you might misunderstand something. So if you think you see a contradiction between scripture and church teaching, church dogma, believe the dogma. Because what the dogma really is, is a correct explanation of what's in scripture. Right. And it's the same parallel in Judaism. Uh, it's not that the Talmud can contradict the Old Testament in the Jewish view. It's that if you should think you should see a contradiction, you should believe the Talmud, because what the Talmud is, is an explanation of sacred scripture. And the Talmud was written? Um, I'm, let me, okay, first of all, in Jewish thought, I'm not saying this is necessarily true, but within the context of Judaism, the Talmud is supposed to be the written down oral tradition that started with Moses. The Talmud in Jewish thought dates from God's revelation to Moses on Mount Sinai, that when God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai and gave him uh, the Torah, the, essentially the, written, the first five books of the Old Testament that we know in written form, God also gave Moses oral instruction. And that oral instruction was passed down um, word of mouth from Moses until the Talmud. Now, it was passed down orally um, from Moses until about the second century A.D. And then when the Jews were exiled from the Holy Land and no longer had a kind of geographical center point, uh, the Jewish rabbis decided it was too risky to rely on oral transmission from that point on because the Jews were going to be spread throughout the world. So at that point, they should write it down even though they weren't supposed to write it down before then. And so that is in Jewish thought what the Talmud is. It's the written down, but it's also divine revelation that was given to Moses passed down orally, and then finally written down when Jews were exiled from the Holy Land. In the Talmud, the Old Testament has uh, teachings about the Messiah, which we can go into, and then the Talmud has explanations of those teachings about the Messiah and further kind of gloss to make those teachings understandable. Interesting. Let's go into uh, some of those teachings on the Messiah. Well, um, it's as astonishing. I mean, uh, for when a Christian reads the Old Testament, and the New Testament. Uh, it depends on the count, but um, different people have seen between probably about 120 messianic prophecies fulfilled by Jesus to 450, 500 messianic prophecies. We know many of them kind of by heart, right? That he will come from Bethlehem, that he will be a descendant of King David, that he will enter Jerusalem riding on an ass, the, the fall of an ass, and on and on and on, all of these beautiful that, you know, his, hands, uh, his, his uh, hands and feet will be pierced. I can count all my bones. Uh, for my garment they cast lots. Um, you know, there are all of these phrases from the Old Testament Messianic prophecies that, that should be very familiar right. um, to, uh, to Christians. Uh, the suffering servant in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, um, by his stripes we are healed, and that he received the stripes in the house of his friends and so forth. So um, there, there's even a messianic prophecy that's absolutely, I think, in, incredible, which is in the book of Daniel, which predicts when the Messiah will come. And um, it's a little bit mysterious, and it's a little bit hard to um, um, interpret, but it certainly looks like it predicts that the Messiah will come basically the exact year that Jesus came, or maybe three years earlier or three years later, 
depending on how you look at it. And you're going to have to walk us through that, because I know I had to read through it a couple of times um, in the book, and it's I'll, fascinating. I'll so. do my best. First of all, I encourage, of course, any listener to, in, 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 entirely in this conversation, you know, to, to go back to the scriptures and to, to look at what we're talking about. But the prophecy is found in Daniel 9, and it appears to predict that the Messiah will, uh, if you go through the years given in the prophecy, and we'll do that in a moment, that the Messiah will appear around 76 AD, which is pretty exactly when Jesus' public ministry began. Um, the uh, prophecy then goes on to state that he will be killed between three and four years later, which is exactly true the, between the wedding at Cain and when his public ministry began and the crucifixion. Um, the, um, the passage is a little bit hard to understand, though, um, because it dates... Uh, uh, let me read some, some of it. Um, from, from the going forth of the word to build up Jerusalem again, because at the time of this prophecy, Jerusalem had been destroyed and the Jews were in exile. From the going forth of the word to build up Jerusalem again unto Christ the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, um, a day in this prophecy, a day is a year, and a week is seven years, like, you know, like a, a week is seven days. Right. So seven weeks is 49 years, because each of those weeks is seven years, and it's seven And was that weeks. common knowledge amongst the Jews, or is that something we've gone back and looked at and interpreted after the fact? The, um, the word for... Um, the word for week is seven. Okay, so this, um, this would have been common knowledge. I'm, I'm sure well, you know, the, that's one of the... Um, I, I, in a sense, I can't answer that because is, is it that every Jew reading this would have understood it correctly? I suspect not. Okay. Is it that there, throughout history, throughout the history of the Jews, um, there were learned Jews who would have read it and interpreted it this way? Probably yes. Um, so the, the seven weeks is 49 years. The 62 weeks, if you do the multiplication of 62 times 7, is 434 years. And the 70 weeks is 490 years. And the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem would refer to the order of King Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem, which comes from the book of Ezra, which was given in about 458 B.C. So if you just add the numbers... It comes out to the fact that, um, that the Messiah was supposed to appear about 26 AD. Now, we know from the New Testament, remember it says in the New Testament, um, I think it is, it is uh, John's disciples who say, you know, is, this, is he the Messiah referring to Jesus? Because it's around now that the Messiah is supposed to appear. Right. And there's several references in the Gospels to the Jewish people being active expectation. You know, is he the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? Because they knew that it was around now that the Messiah was supposed to appear. And that's from this prophecy. And now we know that the, Old Test the New Testament is telling the truth about that. Of course, as Catholics, we know it's telling the truth because right. we know it's true. But even a Jew who rejects everything about Christianity if he's going to be logical, has to realize he's telling the truth about this because the New Testament was originally marketed to Jews right around the time of Christ, right? Within, you know, 30, 40 years after. So the New Testament could hardly be saying all of you Jews were expecting the Messiah to appear if they weren't, right? because they were the target market, so to speak. Well, and I think of the three kings who had, who had followed the numbers and knew the time frame, so that the time frame was known. But... Catholics are too often accused of rewriting history backwards, and I wanted to make that clear that the, the seven weeks would have, or the, excuse me, the week would have been referred to as the seven years. Yeah. The, um, talking about Catholics being accused of rewriting <laughs> history backwards um, Please. anticipates a, a question that you might ask, which is, given this 100 to 500 messianic prophecies of the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the life of Jesus, how can a Jew turn around and say Jesus wasn't the Messiah? Because how could all of these prophecies have been fulfilled? And the, um, the, the Jewish apologetics response to that, in other words, uh, in Judaism there's something called anti-missionaries, which are essentially Jewish apologists who try to talk Jews who begin to believe in Jesus out of believing in Jesus, so they're called anti-missionaries. 
it's apologetics, like mm -hmm. Protestant apologetics and Catholic apologetics and so forth. And the response of the anti-missionaries is, of course, the New Testament Je says Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies because they wrote the New Testament as fiction to pretend that Jesus was the Messiah. So as, as long as they're making it up, of course they would make it up to fit all of the Old Testament prophecies. And yet we find Jesus verified in the Talmud. Very good point. We find, we find Jesus, the truth about Jesus, verified. First of all, there's secular history that attests to um, the, the life of Jesus, to his popularity and his miracle working, and to his crucifixion in, in Josephus. Right. And I think there may be a second historical Roman source. But it's very interesting that the Talmud, which is accepted as kind of sacred scripture by the Jews, has an, in a number of places confirms uh, a lot about Jesus. It says that he was, um, that he grew up in Egypt, that he performed uh, miracles and led the Jewish nation astray, that he was um, executed on the eve of Passover by order of the Jewish authorities, um, and, um, and, and very tellingly that his disciples had the power to uh, heal people and even to bring them back from the point of death. There's, a, in fact, a story in the Talmud which recounts a rabbi who was so holy, he's talking, he's saying that even if you're at the point of death, if one of these disciples of Jesus of Nazareth comes to you and offers to heal you, you should choose to refuse and die rather than be, let yourself be healed in the name of Jesus which is confirmation that right. Jesus' disciples were able right. to heal in the name of Jesus at the point of death. I, f I found that amazing as you were sharing that with us in the Holy Land, and it's shared here in the book. With, they attributed it to sorcery, but they still were acknowledging the miracles. The facts, and the basic the fact facts, that that's right. And th when they said, they, they say that Jesus uh, uh, was brought forth out of Egypt, that he grew up in Egypt, yes. which of course we know is true flight because of Egypt. the flight into Egypt, but the other reason they emphasize that is because their accusation is that he learned the magical arts in Egypt oh, okay. and brought them back with him. Now, I, there's, a, there's an attestation to the truth of Christianity in the Talmud that I know that fascinates you particularly, which is the miracle <laughs> of the scarlet thread. That was on my list of notes. Um, which is, um, uh, the Talmud recounts in two places the fact that before the destruction of uh, the temple in Jerusalem, there used to occur something which was known as the miracle of the scarlet thread. Now, the, um, the old sacramental system before the church came in, the system that Judaism had for the remission of sins, involved in part that on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the most sacred day of the year, one day, that was the one day of the year that the Jewish high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, and he would offer a sacrifice for the remission of the sins of the nation of Israel. When he would enter the Holy of Holies to offer the sacrifice, a red cord would be tied around the uh, entranceway of the Holy of Holies. And when, if the sacrifice was accepted by God and the sins remitted, that it was referred to as a scarlet thread, would miraculously turn white as, as a sign that, you know, as it says uh, in the Old Testament, though your skins be as scarlet, I shall, be, I shall make them as white as snow. Now the Talmud itself recounts that about 40 years before the destruction of the temple, that miracle of the scarlet thread ceased to occur and never occurred again. The temple was destroyed around 70 AD. About 40 years before the destruction of the temple is about 30 AD, in other words, right around the time of the crucifixion. So the Talmud itself says that the sacrificial system for the remission of sins through animal sacrifice was never again accepted by God after the crucifixion of Christ. And yet this miracle had occurred for centuries, and it's recorded in the Talmud that this was an ongoing miracle. Yes, it would occasionally for a year not happen right. if, if the Jews were not forgiven because their sins were so bad, but then the next year it would happen again, they'd have been forgiven. But the only time it ever stopped happening for good was about 40 years before the destruction that of the Temple. That is fascinating. When you have people questioning the historicity of Christ, and then here you see you know, even in the Jewish ancient writings, we have confirmation. And as you mentioned before, the, the historical Roman writings we have. But yet, there still seems to be this, this movement to, to uh, reject that. 
Let me go to, go to another note here. The, uh, well, maybe I should talk about some of the other prophecies and what the Jewish anti-missionaries do with them. Oh, please. In their, um, uh, uh, first of all, just in case anyone's wondering, what do the Jewish anti-missionaries do with the miracle of scarlet thread? Which is interesting. Is um, they say, yes, it's true that from that point on, the, um, the uh, Jews were never forgiven you know, by the sacrifice for their sins. And why did this happen? It happened because they had committed such a terrible sin that it couldn't be forgiven. Want to guess what that sin was? Too many of them had followed Jesus. So they turn it on his head and um, explain it away. They actually are associating with Jesus, right? Right. But they turn it on his head. Now, there are two other uh, Old Testament messianic prophecies that are really the center point of um, Christian apologetics and therefore the center point of Jewish anti-missionary activities. One is, they pierced my hands and my feet from the psalm. Now, the, um, the Old Testament, and this may take up the, the rest of our time for today, but the Old Testament is, of course, a manuscript. It's written by hand, right? It predates printing. And uh, it's written on parchment. Um, actually, it's written on animal skins and uh, that have a finite life, don't live forever. And so it has to be every few hundred years rewritten as the old parchments, um, you know, decay. So there's something called textual variance, where as the scribes rewrite it, occasionally, very, very, very few, but errors creep in. So you'll have different uh, manuscripts with a single letter being different. Maybe, you know, one in 100,000 letters is different as a scribe, you know, kind of makes a slight error. So the, the, the manuscripts that the Christian church relies on have the word, the Hebrew word, be um, they pierced. And the manuscript that the Jewish authorities rely on have the length of the letter is a little bit shorter. It's the, same, it's the same stroke, a vertical stroke, but a short vertical stroke is a letter called a yud in Hebrew, and a long vertical stroke is a vav. And so it's a, it's a, um, it's a yud in one and it's a vav in the other. And um, in the Jewish manuscript, then, it reads, instead of, they pierced my hands and my feet like a lion, my hands and my feet. And which then the, um, uh, the Jewish authorities interpret like a lion, meaning they prowled about my hands and my feet like a lion. So they rely on a different textual variant. Um, so that's one of the um, ways in, in some of the most telling prophecies that the kind of the apologetics used. Well, and you show examples of the letters in here, and it's, it's fascinating to see that, as you say, just the little tail can yeah. change the whole word. Or Which reminds you of what Jesus said, right? Not a jot or a tittle. Exactly. exactly. You know, and it's like the, a jot or a tittle being removed. And I, and I think we'll probably have to come back to this on the next show because there's still more with the messianic property, pro prophecies and the ones that weren't for fulfilled that I'd like to go into and talk more. So. It looks like everybody gets a little reprieve. If you haven't read chapter 4, you get another week to do it. But um, please join us next time as we uh, continue to go through Salvation is from the Jews. If you uh, keep up with the reading, it'll make it easier as we go through. Um, and particularly in cases like this where you can see exactly what you were talking about with the, with the letters that we don't necessarily attribute with uh, the English writing. But uh, you can see clearly how that difference could change it uh, with the lettering as, as you show it there. So thank you again for joining us. I look forward to the next episode as we'll again continue with chapter four. So thank you.